And uh, good afternoon, and welcome to the Hatboro Horsham Community Engagement Listening Session. I'm Cosmo Servidio, the EPA Regional Administrator for Region 3, the Mid-Atlantic Region. Um, I want to thank, take this opportunity to thank our EPA team from headquarters for joining us today and for giving our region an opportunity to offer this community engagement event. Uh, Acting Administrator Wheeler has been personally involved in this event and he wishes he could be here today. However, he, we will be updating him on the outcomes of uh, two of our sessions scheduled for today. Uh, you know, earlier we had the working session which was very productive and again I, I, I uh, thank all the panel the uh, panelists who, who participated. And uh, I know I could speak for um, all the regional administrators. We, we appreciate the uh, leadership of um, Acting Administrator Wheeler. He has been uh, hands-on uh, from, from uh, two or three weeks ago, and, and he has just been uh, really great to work for and work with. Uh, today's events follow the PFAS National Summit in Washington, uh, Washington D.C. in May. At that summit, EPA committed to take action on PFAS by developing a PFAS management plan by the end of this year. There are four key areas that were identified at the national summit that EPA is focused on. You have probably seen these action items on posters around the room, and I know that my colleague, Peter Gravat, from our headquarters office will go into more detail about these proposed actions. As part of, the, as part of these efforts today, EPA is taking steps to proactively and formally engage the public around the development of a plan to manage PFAS, and we welcome your input. To provide a little background information for you, PFAS is a group of man-made chemicals that have been widely used in everyday products since the 1940s. The detection of PFAS compounds in groundwater and soil has raised concerns about potential environmental health risks. Across the Mid-Atlantic region, we have seen numerous sources of PFAS contamination, including fire, firefighting and training areas, manufacturing facilities, landfills, and more. Many of you here today are here today because in some way or another you have been impacted by PFAS. Whether it has been detected in the groundwater where you live or, or, or work, you're all here to tell us what you know. I want to take this opportunity to praise our state partners for all their hard work and I want to thank our communities and community groups for their involvement, cooperation and coordination with EPA, the states and our local governments. Many of these partners participated in an earlier panel discussions today talking about their experiences with PFAS and letting us know their challenges. Today we are here to listen not only at a regional level but at a national level. This is a tremendous opportunity to learn from each other. It is an opportunity for EPA specifically to hear about management practices and experiences that might help us develop our management plan. I am really looking forward to hearing from all of you. Please keep in mind that there is a docket for commenting, so if you aren't going to speak today. My colleague Peter Gravat is going to follow me to dive in a little deeper on national efforts happening on the issue of PFAS. Peter is the head of groundwater and drinking water at EPA's Office of Water in D.C. I look forward to a productive and thought-provoking day. I thank you for all coming, and at this time I ask Peter to provide some national perspective, but I also want to thank uh, the staffs from both Senator Toomey and Senator Casey's offices for being here today uh, and, and their coordination with the regional office on this and, and many other issues, so I do appreciate for them, uh, them being here today. With that said, Dr. Gravat. Carlos, thank you very much. I appreciate uh, very much your, your being here and all of your team, the states who are participating and all the staff from the states, the local hosts and the high school for having us here and all of you in the audience. So much appreciate your taking the time from your busy schedules to share your perspectives with us. It's, it's very, very important for us to be able to hear from you. And as Kaz said, you know, our focus at EPA is to provide tools and information for states and local communities that are impacted by PFAS to address the challenges that you're facing. And uh, Kaz mentioned the National Leadership Summit that we held back in May of this year. And I want to say just a little bit about that. And I know some of you heard my remarks earlier, but there are a number of you, I'm sure, who were not here. And so I'll just give a little bit of perspective and background on that. 
uh, in the meeting in Washington, uh, we asked participants to, to share uh, their perspectives from their, their varied backgrounds um, uh, in terms of their focus on PFAS management efforts. And we had presentations from uh, uh, over 40 states and, and tribes, uh, Guam, Northern Marianas, Islands, we had 13 federal agencies, congressional staff, dozens of associations and industry groups and non-governmental uh, organizations presenting at that meeting. And one of the most important things we said at that meeting, in addition to the four commitments uh, that I'll mention in just a moment, was that we intended to travel around the country, as we're doing here today, to make sure that we fully appreciate the needs and perspectives of uh, community members that have been impacted by PFAS. And so that's what this is all about, building on the heels of the event we did in Exeter, New Hampshire, just a few weeks ago. Uh, and we'll be traveling to a number of other communities across the country. In terms of the four broad commitments that EPA announced at the, at the Leadership Summit, there are two that are regulatory in nature and two other uh, very important steps as well. Uh, the first is that EPA announced that we are in the process of evaluating the need for a maximum contaminant level for a, a regulatory value in drinking water for PFOA and PFOS. And this is an, an issue that, that all the states who spoke and uh, all the community representatives pointed to as a very important step. Um, and so we are working with our federal partners and our state partners to learn all that we can about PFOA, PFOS, and the other PFAS compounds in drinking water so we can uh, make the best decision in terms of how to proceed with regard to development of an MCL. Uh, the second uh, item that we identified at the summit was that we were going to begin the necessary steps uh, to propose designating PFOA and PFOS as hazardous substances under our Superfund law. Uh, and that's a very important step uh, for two reasons. Because in, unless a compound is designated as a hazardous substance, uh, it, under Superfund, we're not able to order cleanups, nor are we able to recover costs that we may incur when cleaning up contaminated sites. So there are a number of different mechanisms to get to this hazardous substance listing, but it's very important in terms of the authorities that will provide to EPA and the states to address contamination that we see related to PFAS. A third area uh, that we committed to was to develop groundwater cleanup recommendations for PFOA and PFOS at contaminated sites. That's an action that we will be completing in the fall of this year. And finally, uh, we're working in close collaboration with other federal agencies and states on the development of toxicity values for additional PFAS compounds. I think many of you are aware that we have drinking water health advisories for PFOA and PFOS. We're currently developing toxicity values for two additional PFAS compounds, one called Gen X and uh, a second called PFBS. Uh, those values are currently undergoing peer review. We'll be posting those by the end of September for public review and comment. So four very important steps uh, related to PFAS. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, in addition to all the other things that we're doing uh, on, on uh, uh, PFAS compounds, which uh, go far beyond those four items I just mentioned, things like development of analytical tools to make sure we can characterize the presence of these compounds and, and making sure that we have uh, the best treatment information. So when they're, when they're found, we're able to provide local communities and states with recommendations on how to treat and remove these compounds from the environment. Uh, in addition to research we're doing to, to, care, to better understand, uh, as you know, there are many thousands of these compounds. Uh, we know a lot about, a fair amount about a few of them. We need to know much more about the compounds that are in the environment. Uh, and uh, we're doing research to help fill those data gaps. But we got very clear recommendations from uh, a number of different parties who participated in the summit um, that, that 
it spoke to a couple of key issues. One being that I think there's a, 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 an appreciation that we don't know nearly as much as we need to about the presence of PFAS in the environment. There has been a lot of monitoring done in a number of areas, but a lot of areas where we know very little and there's much more to do. There was a call among many of the participants for um, uh, regulatory drivers, much as the, the folks here in this meeting earlier today were calling for, and, and those tools that can help states and local communities to take more aggressive action to address PFAS. Uh, and we also heard, uh, I think, a, a, a clear call from many of the participants about the need uh, to balance our work on the small number of compounds where we've taken action thus far with the need to understand much more about the broader set of compounds that are in the environment. So these are issues that we're, that we're already moving forward on at EPA, but I know there are many, many more important issues that we need to hear about from you here in the audience, uh, and that's what this session is all about. Uh, and so Kaz and I will be here along with our colleagues from EPA to hear what every person in the audience who wants to speak has to say and there'll be a process uh, for managing that. Molly will help to, to uh, guide us through that. But we are very, very grateful for your taking time out of your busy schedules to help us appreciate the challenges that you're facing and to hear from you what you need most of all from us at the EPA. Uh, and so thank you all very much for the opportunity to be here with you in Horsham and I'm looking forward to hearing all the perspectives that you have to share today. Great, thank you so much. Let's begin the night just with a quick video from Congressman Boyle's office. Hello, and thank you for attending today's community engagement event. Public participation is vital to our democracy, so I'm pleased to see such great interest in events like these. I'm Congressman Brendan Boyle, and I represent Montgomery County as well as Philadelphia in the United States Congress. I wish I could be with you in person today, but since Congress is in session, I have to be down here in Washington taking votes. Of course, I really wish there was no need to convene this meeting in the first place. Nonetheless, our community has been faced with a great challenge, and I remain fully committed to making sure the federal government finally fulfills its responsibilities to make this situation right. We've come together to discuss PFOA and PFOS chemicals that contaminated our community's drinking water a number of years ago due to the use of a certain firefighting foam by the Department of Defense. There is mounting evidence showing the danger these chemicals pose to human health and the environment. And the list of communities across the country affected by this contamination continues to grow. Unfortunately, though, despite this, the federal government continues to study the issue and play whack-a-mole to remediate instances of contamination on a piecemeal basis after the damage has already been done. That's why I've been fighting on a bipartisan basis to bring the EPA here to our community to meet with each of you. I've also been fighting in Congress for legislation that sets an enforceable limit on the amount of these chemicals in our drinking water. Today is an important step toward remediating the contamination here locally and making sure it doesn't happen anywhere else. But I believe that will only happen with a strong, safe drinking water act regulation from the EPA. And that's something I've been fighting for for a number of years now. It is my hope that by hearing from communities like ours, the EPA as well as the Republican leadership here in Washington will have the courage to finally put people before politics and regulate these contaminants with the seriousness they merit. Every American deserves to have confidence in the safety of the air they breathe and the water they drink. So please take this time to make your voice heard and ask any questions you have of the EPA staff members who have agreed to participate today. And I really do thank them for being here in our community. Please know that whether in Washington or back home, I won't stop fighting to remedy this issue today and into the future, in Horsham and across the country. Thank you for your efforts. I wish you a productive meeting, and please don't hesitate to contact me or my office 
if you have any further concerns on this or any other issue. Again, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it. Um, I'd like to go through a few housekeeping items to make sure tonight goes smoothly. We have about five and a half hours allotted for community speaking time, and we really want to hear from as many as you as possible. Um, if you've pre-registered and signed up to speak, but you have not yet received your number, would you mind please stepping out to the registration table, and they will set you up. Um, each speaker will have a total of three minutes. We have a timer right here, and we have um, a lovely one minute left sign, so we will keep you on track. When the light turns yellow, you also have one minute. When your light turns red, we will um, move to the next speaker. Uh, we'll call up the speakers in groups of four. Um, the gr first group of four will sit here at the table across from us. Please stay seated until everyone has spoken. The next four on deck will be in the chairs right to the right of the table. Um, Please be courteous to the upcoming speakers and end your remarks around the three minute mark so others are able to speak. We have a great number of speakers tonight, so let's please try to transition quickly through the speakers. Um, we are here to listen. If you have any questions throughout the session, there's a number of EP employees throughout the audience and outside wearing name tags, so please don't hesitate to come up and chat with us. Um, let's get started with the four to five hour, so if you guys wouldn't mind coming on up. If you're in the four to five hour, we do have reserved seats over here to the right, so feel free to sit here to make the transition quicker. Um, and then let's have numbers one through eight come up on stage, one through four at the table, and five through eight at the chairs behind. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Speaker number one, you are free to begin. My name is Eric Forrester, and I'm a technical development engineer with Calgon Carbon Corporation. PFAS affect everyone. Whether you're here today as a private citizen or a public servant, these compounds have impacted your life in a significant way. They are in water sources across the country and are associated with potentially devastating long-term health effects. Unfortunately, most public water systems are not capable of removing these harmful contaminants. Remediation and treatment of PFAS can seem like an intimidating problem to address, but Calgon Carbon has been removing these compounds from water for more than a decade. Based on this experience, we know that granular activated carbon, also known as GAC, is an effective and proven technology for PFAS treatment. We also know that not all GAC is the same, and it is important to select the right product. More than 45 utilities, including Horsham Water and Sewer Authority and others in eastern Pennsylvania, as well as thousands of point of entry treatment systems across the country are using our GAC and equipment to treat PFAS. Whether the contamination is based in PFOA and PFOS, short chain PFAS, Gen X, or some combination thereof, GAC can remove these contaminants to non-detectable levels. GAC loaded with PFAS can be recycled through thermal reactivation, whereby the contaminants are destroyed and removed from the GAC, allowing the GAC to be subsequently reused for continued treatment. GAC systems can be designed to meet the most stringent treatment objectives. However, there are situations where GAC is not the most effective or economical solution and another technology is more appropriate. Calgon Carbon also has ion exchange resins in their product portfolio and has provided ion exchange technology for PFAS treatment as well. We always recommend focused source water testing to predict service life, estimate operational costs, and determine the best treatment solution. I'm an engineer, and I have expertise in the treatment of uh, PFAS compounds in drinking water. I know how GAC works, and I've seen data from dozens of municipal drinking water systems. I've heard that some people are continuing to use bottled water but if I'm in a community that is using our GAC, I'm not afraid to drink the tap water. Calgon Carbon has a wealth of experience with PFAS, GAC, and ion exchange resins. 
For more information, please visit our website, calgoncarbon.com, or please email us at pfcsolutions at calgoncarbon.com. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Speaker number two, you're free to begin. Uh, my name is Joel Newlight. I live in Warminster. I'm a uh, graduate chemical, chemical engineer with a master's degree. I am currently retired. Um, I'm a life member of American Water Works Association, which is um, approximately 60,000 professionals involved in the water treatment on, all over the world. I served on the board of directors of that organization and for approximately three years and also on committees. I also worked for Calgon Carbon for almost 28 years and, and then 10 years with Severn Trend Services for disinfection equipment. I sold, engineered, and started up over several hundred activated carbon systems and other technologies for contaminated water, uh, groundwater contamination and surface water supplies, as well as wastewater treatment. I attended numerous national conventions and probably several of these type of uh, conferences, presented papers, published papers on the use of granular activated carbon for water and groundwater and surface water treatment. I currently live at the Village of Five Ponds in Warminster, which has contaminated wells and PFAs, PFOAs, etc. I like to call those things critters instead of all the names that everyone has given them. Um, I think the following statement might raise an eyebrow or two, but there is no safe level of any carcinogen. We talk of them as risk levels. They are risk levels set by the EPA, whether they be one in 10,000, one in 100,000, or one in a million, et cetera. There's always one in something. Our wells were taken offline. Our current water comes from North Wales, which is the Delaware River, which by the way, that treatment plant also uses granular activated carbon. Our development has about 200 people, which by the way, have had five cases of pancreatic cancer, which is extremely high for 200 people. Um, we have incurred additional costs since we went to the Delaware River, which I believe we should be reimbursed for, and if and when treatment is installed, we should also be reimbursed for that cost, which should be paid by the polluter in perpetuity. I like that, that came from uh, Mr. Wonderful. Non-detect, make that very clear, is not zero. Zero is no such thing as our analytical capabilities get better and better. The most important word that was brought up in all the presentations is we need deadlines. Again, I've attended a lot of these conferences on every kind of contamination over the years, and it seems like these things drag on forever, and we never seem to come to deadlines, enforcements, numbers. MCLs is not a health issue. We need to come up with numbers, and again, Zero is not attainable. Thank you so much. You may begin. Hi, my name's Sean O'Connor. I'm the district office manager for state representative Catherine Watson. Unfortunately, Representative Watson couldn't be here today. Actually, she's in the hospital or she would be here. She gave me her prepared statement to read. I will not be addressing the panel today as a Pennsylvania representative not only as a Pennsylvania representative of the 144th district, including Warrington Township, which has been greatly impacted by the PFOA contamination at the former Horsham Air Base. But I will also be speaking to you as a resident of Warrington who has been drinking the water for the past 39 years, and by the way, was diagnosed with thyroid cancer several years ago with no family history. One of the many medical side effects as identified by the recent report released by the ATSDR. I know we will be hearing many similar stories tonight of serious medical maladies. Many of our residents have been experiencing after years of drinking the contaminated water. Many of whom, like me, have been unknowingly drinking this highly contaminated water for decades. As mothers, we have bathed our children and mixed their baby formula with this water. My son, who is now an adult, often asks me what his health ramifications will be as a result of the drinking water. And I honestly don't have an answer for him, except stay vigilant and report any unusual symptoms to your doctor. As a parent, it is 
haunting to think your child could have been exposed to something this terrible, and it was at my own hands as I prepared Kool-Aid and other beverages for him as the neighborhood kids all throughout his childhood years. I actually kept them away from soda at the time because I thought that was the better choice as a parent. The tragic news of the contamination was released back in 2015. The military began to serve bottled water to residents and initiated well testing in an attempt to provide clean drinking water. After years of negotiating with the local municipalities affected, the military did provide funds for the municipalities to put GAC filtration systems, but only on those public wells that were above 70 parts per trillion. Currently, Warrington still has four wells offline because they are not above 70 parts per trillion, but they are still are measuring PFOS contamination levels above zero detect. And Warrington Water has made a commitment to providing only zero detect water to residents since there has been such long-term exposure, our bodies need time to purge the contaminant. So these wells remain offline. So despite compulsory efforts to, to remedy the problem, the military has sadly fallen short on protecting our residents from this contamination. And as we speak today, there is still contamination running off the base into Park Creek and Little Nishamnia at appalling levels especially in rainy weather events like today. We are talking about upwards of 370,000 parts per trillion, and there does not seem to be an immediate resolution in the near future to stop this ongoing contamination. My staff attends the quarterly BRAC meetings where this information is publicly shared. I want to make sure this panel is aware that this is a real problem and there does not seem to be enough urgency coming from the feds to mandate that they get this cleaned up and stop on any specific time frame. What good is filtering all the water when you're still contaminating groundwater and public waterways, which also affect our wildlife? Fur Furthermore, by not containing the pollution, the contaminated underground plume continues to travel to communities outside of our immediate area, and residents want answers. As their representative, I would like to bring forward the concerns of our citizens to you today. Number one, we would like the EPA to seriously consider the recent health report released by the ATSDR that recommends lowering the health advisory level to seven, which is 10 times less than the current HAL level being used today. Our residents specifically have been drinking such high concentrations of the chemicals, our body needs time to purge it from our system. By continuing to drink any levels of PFOS, it will only bioaccumulate in our systems, causing more medical problems. And this leads me to item number two. Our residents want blood testing and biomonitoring. They deserve to know how this is impacting their health. And our service men and women and employees who worked at the base over the years should be notified about the exposure and offered blood testing. Many of these men and women may now live in other areas of the country, and I feel strongly that they should be notified. I work with Mr. Joe McGrath, who you will hear from today, who has formed a group to locate as many of these victims as possible. Many we already know are no longer with us as they have suffered with medical issues and have unfortunately passed away. And finally, our residents want the military to pay all the required remediation and the cost to import zero detect water to our residents so we can cleanse our systems. Ladies and gentlemen, as you travel to various parts of the country, you will surely hear these stories time and again. This is a nationwide problem caused by the military's use of hazardous foam. Therefore, state taxpayers should not be left with the bill to clean, this, clean up this mess. Thank you so much. Next. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just take a few moments. I also work for State Representative Watson um, as an outreach specialist, but I also work on policy and research, and specifically, I've been working on this water contamination issue for the past two and a half years. And I just would like to emphasize uh, one of the statements Representative Watson uh, was, was referring to, and that is the financial and the health impact of this contamination. And you know, we look beyond just the health issue, we look at what is it costing individuals who are dealing with these health issues. We're looking at what is the cost 
of the water? What is the cost for drinking healthy, clean water? There's a cost, there's a fee. And we have residents who have been coming into our office recently because there's been an increase in the Warrington tax bill, as was discussed earlier today, and often these residents are very angry. And when I sit with them and I tell them why their bill has increased, they're shocked. And so it concerns me that enough residents really aren't informed or engaged in this situation enough to really realize what has been happening, what's going on. But I guarantee you, when they leave my office, they're often happy to pay the sometimes five to 10 times increase in their water bill. Because I explained to them that today, as we speak, as, me as mentioned in Representative Watson's speech, 379,000 parts per trillion is what is being measured at the base currently today, running into our waterways on these rainy day conditions. And I ask you, what do we think those levels were five, 10, or 20 years ago before any remediation was done? They could be 10 times higher. Our residents have been drinking highly, highly contaminated water, and it has been bioaccumulating in our systems, as, as we've witnessed from several reports of people reporting cancer and other health issues and conditions. And so that's when I explained to the residents why their water bill is so high, is because Warrington, along with Warminster and Horsham, have all bound together to commit to providing non-detect water to our residents. So I just implore you as you travel around the country to think about this impact that it's having on our residents, specifically here, because we're much higher. And I wonder if it's possible to it, to put a mandate in place, an emergency mandate, for those communities that have been highly impacted like this to immediately lower the health advisory level for those communities. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, speakers 5 through 8, please come up. And speakers 9 through 12, please make your way to the on-deck seats. You may start when you're ready. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. My name is Colleen Haynes. I'm here on behalf of my parents, John and Judy Haynes, who have lived in their home at the corner of Maple and Arbutus Avenue for the past 55 years, just two blocks away from the Willow Grove Naval Air Station. In February of 2004, my parents decided to have their well tested when three of their daughters were diagnosed with thyroid conditions. QC Labs performed an analysis, however, since there were no EPA guidelines on acceptable PFAS levels, their, their well was deemed safe. Safe despite the following. One daughter was diagnosed with thyroid cancer. One daughter has, was diagnosed with multiple, multiple nodules on her thyroid and continues to be monitored by having needles injected into her neck. Uh, I myself was diagnosed with Graves' disease in 2002, and then in 2009, my autoimmune system attacked again. This time it was my spine, leaving me, uh, leaving me with paralyzed arms and legs for a period of three months. Another daughter has experienced seizures and continues to experience neurological uh, issues. Um, she also had a mass removed from her breast and has abnormal thyroid levels. My dad would be here, but he's in dialysis for stage four kidney failure. My mom is here. Uh, she is struggling with an autoimmune hemoly hemolytic anemia. Her red blood cells don't mature, leading to high hemoglobin levels. She turns yellow, and her kidneys and liver cannot process her blood properly. She was also hospitalized several times uh, in critical condition and has repeatedly experienced AFib. So this is why I'm pissed. The Department of Navy, thank you. The Department of Navy tested uh, my parents' well in, 2000, in September of 2014 and in April 2016. In 2014, there were no guidelines, but if they were to be measured against today's guidelines, uh, they would have failed. They failed in 2014 and 2016. So I actually question the guidelines, and I believe further investigation is needed to determine the half-life in humans with long-term exposure, especially during the developmental years. In 2016, when they sealed the abandoned uh, well, uh, the department, um, excuse me, um, no one came out to interview the family to see how they may have been affected by the contamination. They ignored it. Uh, no one initiated a voluntary health survey of those families who had their wells condemned. Uh, so I, I really want to see an epidemiological study done. 
instead of the randomly selected ha uh, households of the general population that were offered the option to have testing. Um, the Navy had my parents sign an agreement that allowed them access to the property to hook them up to public water for free of charge, but now they have to pay for water. My concern is that the public water continues to be at risk, they could, and they could end up like Detroit with astronomical water bills. Great. Thank you so much. Next speaker. Good evening, my name is Paul Leonard. I'm the township manager in Upper Dublin Township and I do want to speak uh, first uh, directly uh, at the direction of the Board of Commissioners of Upper Dublin Township. On July 10th of this year, they indicated uh, their uh, unanimous support for state legislation, which Representative Merck, the next speaker, is sponsoring, uh, known as the Pennsylvania Safe Drinking Water Act, uh, as well as recommending to the Pennsylvania Environmental Quality Board uh, actions which EPA can help with. Obviously that is to the setting of maximum limits as well as the technical assistance to those agencies which implement many of your regulations and rely upon you. Uh, so we would encourage EPA to support those organizations as well as understand this legislation. Um, beyond that support, Upper Dublin Township with some 28,000 residents is, is uh, provided water, drinking water from three different types of water utilities. Uh, the first, Aqua America, which is present here today, about 34% of the township is provided for that. Uh, Aqua, from my assessment as township manager, is in need of your support for a rapid understanding of the conditions for groundwater and the impact on their wells, as well as their surface water uh, 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 sources for uh, drinking water. They are also in, in need of your new, a new uh, maximum limit so that they can take actions such as uh, filters applied to contaminated wells in Upper Dublin Township. Also, I would encourage uh, EPA to uh, assist all these uh, state agencies in rapidly deploying those filters uh, rather than wait. Th those are the end of my comments. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. And if anyone was not able to finish their comments, if you have anything written down, you're more than welcome to submit that to our docket. We have a box out front. You may begin when you're ready. Good, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Tom Mert. I'm a state representative. I represent part of Eastern Montgomery County and part of Northeast Philadelphia. A report from the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry has indicated that safe levels of PFAS in our water are much less than the standard of 70 parts per trillion now used by the federal government. This new data manifests that many more communities than previously thought are being supplied with water that is unsafe to consume. And the township of Upper Dublin, which I represent, is one of those communities. With documented levels of PFAS well above the tougher standards now recommended, residents from Upper Dublin and other communities are justifiably concerned and expect action to ensure that their drinking water is safe. PFAS contamination has been linked to a wide variety of serious health issues, and residents of Warminster and Horsham are just now learning about the increased incidence of disease in their community related to PFAS toxins. They are rightly devastated to learn that the source of their medical issues is likely their own drinking water. These neighbors are now asking how this could happen and what other medical challenges may be in their future and in the future of their children. These new guidelines reveal that there is no doubt many communities throughout the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania are currently being exposed to these toxic chemicals. This crisis must be addressed or we face even more devastating health hazards. I've written House Bill 705, which requires that acceptable PFAS levels in Pennsylvania be reduced from 70 to five parts per trillion. Other states, including New Jersey and Vermont, have already taken this action. And with EPA support, this bill can become law, and we can afford all Pennsylvanians their constitutional rights to clean water. Now that we know the dangers associated with even small amounts of PFAS, it is our responsibility to take action. Communities like Upper Dublin and others that are peripheral to a base like NAS Willow Grove or the former Johnsville Naval Air Station have been affected, but have largely remained under the radar in discussions about the impact of PFAS. The contamination of wells and water supplies is not limited to zip codes contiguous to these bases. Residents have a right to expect their government to regulate their water so it's safe to drink as outlined in the Safe Drinking Water Act. 
According to the EPA, the most effective oversight of water systems is conducted by state drinking water programs. When the federal government does not effectively protect its citizens, as in the case of this PFAS contamination, then a state should intervene to ensure public health and safety. House Bill 705 will protect all Pennsylvanians by requiring PFAS toxins be removed from their water. Therefore, I'm asking the EPA's consideration and technical support of the passage of this critical piece of legislation. And I close by reminding you that this PFAS toxic toxin program was caused by the federal government and is the responsibility of the federal government to clean up. We should not become another Flint, Michigan before action is taken. Finally, we deserve a sense of urgency on this issue. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. On behalf of the Pennsylvania Chamber of Business Industry, the largest broad-based business advocacy association in the Commonwealth, I want to thank EPA for holding this event to gather information and stakeholder input on this important issue. My name is Brian Clark. I'm a law partner at the firm of Buchanan, Ingersoll, and Rooney, and I chair the Pennsylvania Chamber's Environmental Committee, and I'm also a resident of Buckingham Township, where I have a private well with uh, activated carbon system. The Pennsylvania Chamber has been active and positively involved throughout the past several decades in working with other stakeholders in helping to frame workable approaches to addressing water quality and remediation challenges in, in the state. For example, uh, 25 years ago, Pennsylvania Chamber was very involved in the development of the Pennsylvania uh, Act II, uh, which is the uh, Brownfields program, in the development of the regulations, the development of the guidance document we worked with. Uh, it was a private-public partnership with uh, DEP and EPA, and it's one of the most successful brownfield programs in the country. At the chamber, uh, or as the chamber has expressed in its previous comments on various legislation regarding water policy, EPA and DEP proposed rulemaking and the proposals by interstate water basin commissions for Ohio, Delaware, Susquehanna rivers. The chamber and its members recognized the, that protection, development, and use and stewardship of the state water resources is vital to the health and success of our communities, industries, and enterprise throughout the state. It is with this perspective that we offer the following comments. We share the concerns of the community and EPA and hope to be part of a continued discussion and dialogue on solutions. Such a discussion must include a broad array of stakeholders, including those in the private sector who are well-versed and skilled in technical aspects of water's treatment and remediation. As the knowledge of surrounding these emerging, emerging contaminants continues to build, it is important that we be judicious with respect to incorporating and growing understanding of any rulemaking or regulatory action. To date, we have identified several challenges with respect to this issue that we believe merit further discussion and deliberation among stakeholders. PFAS are used in many products. And we use them daily, and we consider and there are considered to be surfactants with over 200 plus individual compounds. PFAS are persistent compounds that do not degrade over time. Further plumes have been shown to be, move fairly quickly, making sampling and characterization of the plumes difficult to define at times. With respect to the removal of PFAS from, from military installations, it is our understanding that the current federal defense budgeting rules obligate the full multi-year cost of the cleanup to be made available upfront, even if the project has been carried out over several years. Another point, Pennsylvania is one of only two states that do not regulate the construction of private water wells. There is a lack of regulatory framework to ensure that private water wells are being constructed in a manner to be protected. Finally, Thank you so much. You can submit your comments for the record. Thank you. Numbers 13, or 9 through 12, please come up to the speaker's table. And numbers 13 through 16, please come up to the on-deck chairs. Anyone else who has not spoken in the four to five hour, please make your way over to the seats, and we will begin the five to six hour shortly. While they're assembling, I lost a, an alumni this week to cancer, John Greer, unexpectedly, and he lived two blocks from me.
whenever you're ready. Thank you. Um, thank you for hearing us. Um, this is my story. My name is Michelle Miller. I'm 49 years old. I moved to Warminster in May of 1994 when my husband and I purchased our first home as newlyweds. We have three children, ages 21, 19, and 18. In July of 2006, I was experiencing severe body aches, rash, and fever. At first, it was an occasional feeling of flu-like symptoms, but as time went on, the pain and the flare-ups became more frequent. By 2008, I had a slew of doctors, allergists, rheumatologists, endocrinologists, hematologists. All I knew is that my body was attacking itself. My blood work was abnormal, my inflammatory markers were skyrocketed, my hemoglobin was extremely low, and I was anemic. I felt terrible, sometimes not being able to get out of bed for days. I was hospitalized multiple times over the years, but never had a diagnosis. My illness progressed. It affected my personal relationships, my work, and my mind. After years of suffering and countless doctors, tests, and the expenses that come along with it, I felt hopeless and very frustrated. I was extremely depressed and had thoughts of ending it all. In April of 2016, I was admitted to Thomas Jefferson University Hospital with 104 plus degree fever, horrendous body rash, and I was incapable of walking. During my eight, stay at Jefferson, my eight day stay at Jefferson, I was put on the biologic medication Kinneret and was diagnosed with adult onset Stills disease with macrophage activation syndrome. I've been on the medication since April 18th of 2016. The monthly copay for this medication is $1,000. This is after my insurance first denied coverage and I had to go through the process of appeals. The medication does mask my symptoms, but my liver and my kidneys are permanently damaged. I worry for the health of my family, and I'm pleading with the EPA. We need to begin to regulate all the chemicals in our drinking water to keep our children safe. The chemicals are toxic, and we need enforceable drinking standards to protect our families and communities. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hello. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Denny. I'm just a wife, mother of five, grandmother of nine and a half, and just an ordinary resident of Horsham. Water is a touchy subject lately, but it really shouldn't be. In the 1980s, my family lived at Midway Park in Camp Lejeune in North Carolina. Through mailings, I found out that we were exposed to PFAS. I had learned then that the ex that there were many dire health issues caused by the exposure to these, ranging from immune health system, immune system issues, learning disabilities, and cancer. I myself was diagnosed after a very long period with odd symptoms with sarcoidosis, which is a hyperactive immune system that is often caused by exposure to unnatural substances. We moved to Horsham in 2006. My husband never, ever was sick, ever, until the morning in the summer of 2009 where he saw blood in his urine. Only nine days ago, my husband had a radical eight-hour surgery to remove his prostate, his bladder, and part of his ureter. Cancer. That's what he's been battling since 2009. Mind you, we moved to Horsham in 2006. Scientists, according to the ATSDR, have studies that have shown an increase in cancer and other illnesses amongst tons of different things that are caused by the exposure with these initials, PFAS. We can talk science and data all we want, and often we get so wrapped up in the numbers and the statistics and the probabilities, we forget that there are lives, human lives affected. Families watching loved ones go through treatments, getting weak, and some passing away. I am an administrator of a Facebook page called Horsham Toxic Water Residents Standing Together. I post a simple question on that page. Who here is affected with cancer in the Horsham area? I wish I could say that question remained unanswered. I wish I could say it went unnoticed, but it has reached almost 2,000 people with stories that would just make you cry. There are just a few of, oh, sorry. 
People from Meeting House Village, Oak Hill, Windmere Downs, and all over the Horsham area gave me story after story of sickness and death. Real people who wanted to come to live in a community that provided good schools, great neighbors, and live out the American dream. However, because they chose a community affected by water that was essentially poison, the American dream ended up becoming a nightmare. And to add further salt to the wound, I picked the day I picked up my husband from the hospital, I opened up a water bill and got a $4 credit for a recent issue in the Horsham water system. I brought my husband home from the hospital on Friday. He is an amazingly strong man who helps out his neighbors. He is gaining strength every day. Nothing will bring those parts of him back, though. Nothing will make him the same as he was before. Thank you so much. Would you mind passing the mic down and we can have this? Thank you so much. Whenever you're ready. Uh, Tina O'Rourke, Horsham Water and Sewer Authority. Uh, you did hear from the authority earlier during the local panel session, so I appreciate you indulging me as I reiterate some of those recommendations. Um, from personal experience, one of the challenges that uh, I have dealt with um, since 2014 when this contamination first came to light is risk communication. And, and that confusion that is among our residents um, I found to be around the various numbers or standards that have, that have been established. Um, and I know in the water business when it comes to measuring levels of a contaminant, there is no such thing as zero. Um, and, but we re so we rely on, on EPA to tell us what number is, is safe. And personally, I, I don't care if it's enforceable. I don't care what you call it, an MCL, a health goal, a, um, a lifetime health advisory. We just need a, we need a number. Um, and it does, like I said, it doesn't matter uh, whether it's enforceable because as a water supplier, our mission, our obligation is to provide safe drinking water. Um, in the Safe Drinking Order Act, there are some core uh, principles in establishing a standard. Um, this includes current data, um, uh, health effects, of course, and, um, and, and it also takes into account cost. Um, each of those, I think, um, can be addressed pretty easily. Um, as far as the current data, I think we need a redo of UCMR3. Um, the, M the minimum reporting limits for uh, UCMR3 for the six PFAS compounds that were uh, analyzed under, under UCMR3, um, the, the minimum reporting limits were very low. Um, PFA, PFAS and PFOA combined was 60 parts per trillion, which is only 10 parts below the current 70 lifetime health advisory. As for the health data, um, I think you have an opportunity right here in Horsham, Warminster, and Warrington. Um, the National Defense Authorization Act uh, allocated funds for a national PFAS study. Um, and to that I say, pick us. Pick us, please. Um, and then as to the economic feasibility, um, in this case, uh, treatment efficiency, um, which is, you know, it costs, it determines how much it's going to cost to treat this, um, can be improved by um, remediating at the source. So we know, we know where the source is. Um, we've got two contiguous pieces of property that are at the, the heart of this contamination, and those remediation plans need to be aligned. Um, and as far as the, the cost, we know who the polluter is. The government should just print more money. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. My name is Dominic Argentieri, and I'm with Evoqua Water Technologies. Evoqua is an undisputed leader in North American water treatment in both industrial settings and municipalities across the country. Uh, our products are used by more than 200,000 uh, municipalities across the United States. I'd like to take a moment to thank the EPA for the uh, leadership in putting together the PFAS Summit and also opening up these regional meetings for the public. Um, as the EPA has stated, one objective was to get 
community engagement by visiting impacted communities and to hear directly from the public uh, on how to help states and communities to deal with this issue. The good news for everyone here is that there is technology and solutions to combat this issue. In fact, we work with many communities to address PFAS issues across the country and mostly in New England and the Mid-Atlantic region currently. Uh, federal and state, local and officials should know that we stand ready to help and we look forward to speaking with you. There are a number of us available today to speak with you today uh, or at any time, so please feel free to reach out at evoqua.com. Thank you for your time today. Thank you so much. Will thir speakers 13 through 16 please come up to the table? Is there anyone left in the four to five hour that has not come up to the table? Okay, five to six. Okay, so if everyone has come up to the on deck chairs and It looks like we have one. Uh, will speaker 17 in the four to five hour please come up to the team? Thank you. You can come up to the table if you'd like. Okay. You may you start when you're ready. Okay, my name is Lisa Cellini. Uh, my family, my, my husband and two young sons, we moved here in 1998 to Horsham. We weren't sick before. We actually moved because of crime in Philadelphia where we lived before. We wanted a safer neighborhood. Anyhow, two years after um, I moved here, I had trouble walking. And um, I was diagnosed with Guillain-Barre, which is a disease of the peripheral nervous system. I'm a nurse, by the way, and I have public health background, master prepared nurse, and I worked county level health department. Um, two years after that, um, I started to get better. Um, and then it, when I was 2012, had more symptoms. And then in 2015, I was diagnosed with MS. Okay, MS, I don't know if it's from our water. I, I know enough to know scientifically, I can't say it's the water. However, in my neighborhood of 31 people, I know two women diagnosed with MS. In a square five mile radius of my house, I know of six people diagnosed with MS, two of which are in wheelchairs. I'm very lucky I'm not in a wheelchair and I'm handling it very well. My sons are healthy, they're in their, in their 20s. My husband is healthy. They drank the same water I did. Um, I also, on my son's lacrosse team of 50 parents, three people have MS. I know something's wrong. You're, we live here and we can see it every day. I have a friend who was less than 50, got a brain tumor. She had a public, her own well. You could see the base from her backyard practically. Um, she is now on epilepsy med. She's alive, but she has to take these drugs for the rest of her life. Um, I know another couple, barely 50. Husband had prostate cancer. I know it's testicular cancer, that's the issue but it was prostate cancer. Wife had thyroid cancer within two years of each other. Um, I know a 25-year-old man who is waiting for his second kidney transplant. Something's wrong. I know a 27-year-old girl who was diagnosed with thyroid cancer at age 15, and she's on medicine now for the rest of her life. I'm asking questions of people when I go around and I see these numbers aren't normal. You go to Philly, you're not gonna find this in, in this concentration. Are we allowed to ask you questions? Tonight's just for listening, but you're more than welcome All right, to Brendan Boyle said we could ask questions, so I just thought I would ask. Um, I want levels reduced, like everybody's saying right away. I want it at the state level. And you're more than welcome to talk to any of the EPA All staff right. here the, the, the big audience. question is, New Jersey and New Hampshire have lower levels. Why can't we? in Pennsylvania? That's the big question. Thank you so much. Hello, I'm Tracy Carluccio, Deputy Director of Delaware Riverkeeper Network, and we appreciate the opportunity to comment on the PFAS water crisis here in this region. While it is encouraging today to hear what EPA is doing and planning to do, we frankly have heard agency promises before. It must be said that EPA has been culpable 
in the ongoing disaster here and across the nation regarding PFAS. EPA knew and stated that it knew PFCs were toxic many years ago when its science advisory board labeled PFOA a likely carcinogen, and West Virginia's concerns surfaced in the late 1990s, revealing broader public health concerns related to drinking water. Attorney Rob Ballot, starting in 2001, worked continually to, through to today to inform EPA with hard evidence and, despite the C8 panel's verification of human health effects around DuPont's Washington Works plant, EPA still did not regulate. In fact, in 2012, EPA said it would take them until 2022 to 2025 to set a safe drinking water standard based on lifetime exposure. I didn't even hear a date today. Stunning that EPA could move at such a snail's pace while these toxic compounds were escaping into the environment without control and people were getting sick. Even when EPA added six PFCs to its unregulated contaminant monitoring rule and verified its widespread incurrence, it didn't use the rule as it was intended to set a mandatory regulation standard. They simply issued a weak and unprotective advisory level of 70 parts per trillion. But the monitoring rule is how most communities, including us here, found out that PFCs are in the water supplies, which began a firestorm nationally as well as locally. Certainly, no one else was openly discussing the contamination, even though they knew, the Department of Defense knew, at least 15 years ago. But they continued to use toxic firefighting foam. Now they have to investigate hundreds of military sites and have already found 90 groundwater sites contaminated, a disgraceful legacy. In the absence of EPA regulation, Pennsylvania must act. It's that simple. It's why Delaware Riverkeeper Network submitted a petition in May 2017 requesting the Pennsylvania's Environmental Quality Board and Pennsylvania DEP set a statewide maximum contaminant level for PFOA of one parts per trillion or no higher than six parts per trillion, basically non-detect. And last month, we sent a letter to the EQB advising them that New Jersey had, after extensive research and analysis, recommended a PFOA uh, P par um, maximum contaminant level of 13 parts per trillion, reinforced by the ATSDR study. Pennsylvania must act in the absence of federal action. Delaware R Riverkeeper Network, by the way, represent, rep recommends an MCL of an e even lower level. Delaware Riverkeeper Network calls on the EPA and Pennsylvania DEP, along with the community here, to set a mandatory safe drinking water standard now. New Jersey and other scientists have done the science. The occurrence data across Pennsylvania is in, and we need the standards yesterday. Clean water is our constitutional right. Look it up. Article 1, Section 27 of the Pennsylvania Constitution. Thank you so much. Thank you. My name's Lauren Ware. Um, I've lived in Horsham for 12 years of the, the last 12 years, the first half of which very near the Navy base in Sawmill Village. And in 2012, when my husband and I decided we wanted a single family home and we loved the community and didn't know about the water, we moved five minutes away. Two years ago yesterday, I found out I was pregnant and we were very excited and we were also scared because at that point we had learned about the water and we didn't know what might be in me. Out there is Caroline, um, my little 16 month old. And throughout my entire pregnancy, I was so careful. I ate organic and I wouldn't take a Tylenol for a headache and I crossed the street to avoid secondhand smoke. The thought that those chemicals were already in me when I formed her, when I nursed her, that I don't know what effects they're going to have on her as she gets older, if she's gonna have learning disabilities, if she's gonna have so many of the other things I've heard discussed today, is absolutely terrifying to me. And then to realize that We've been told we don't have to worry about these cancer clusters or MS or everything that we've been hearing about from so many people, numbers that we know aren't right. And we've been told don't worry about that, but we know we've been lied to repeatedly before. It's pretty hard to believe any of it. I would be more inclined to believe if, if you would follow through and do something. We have to pay for increased filtration, but we still can't get testing for our water systems or our bodies. I wanna be tested. I wanna know what's happening inside of my body, what might be happening to my daughter. I want my neighbors to be tested. I want more than a couple hundred people to be tested. And I don't think any of us should have to pay for that. We need a new standard of our water right now, of course. 
And that's a given. People who know more about this than I have spoken about that. But I want to see that we are tested, that anybody who wants it has that availability. And if you want us to start believing you, then prove it by providing the testing. Thank you. Whenever you're ready. Good evening. My name is Mike McGee, and I am the executive director of the Horsham Land Redevelopment Authority, responsible for the redevelopment of the former naval base. While the future development of the former base is of great importance to Horsham and the region, the health and well-being of our existing and future residents is the top priority. We ask that EPA take all necessary steps to address the PFAS issue to include the following as a minimum. PFOA and PFOS should be listed as a circular hazardous substance. The government should retain all liability for all PFAS contamination resulting from past use of or spills that were um, to include current and future costs incurred by the water providers. Government standards should be consistent. The differences between EPA and ATS DR need to be resolved. EPA should require that the former Naval Air Station Joint Reserve Base Willow Grove and the Horsham Air Guard Station to have the remedial plan and the same expedited remediation schedule. Given the financial impact to the township and the residents, the federal government should transfer the ownership of the property with, with assurances that the US, United States will retain responsibility for all remedial remediation necessary to protect the public health, safety, and well-being, and the um, conveyance should be at no cost to the township. Sources of PFAS remain on the base, in the water, and in the soil, and they must be remediated as part of the plan. The impacts to the past exposure have been ignored. Most extensive, more extensive epidemiological testing for the community is needed to include the former military members and also the employees at the base. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Is speaker 16 from, from the four to five hour here? Okay, great. No? 18? Okay, is any, one through five in the five hour block here? Speaker 18, thank you. And, and speakers one through three in the five hour block, if you'd like to make your way up to the table, you may as well. Speakers four and five in the five hour block, if you're here, you're welcome to come to the on deck chairs. My name is Pamela Rizzo. I'm a resident of Horsham Town Development. And I Can you hold it a little closer to your mouth? Thank you. Sure. I live in Horsham Town Development. I've been a resident for 37 years. I recently have called the water department, who's basically turned me over to Aqua, telling them that I've has smelt and seen a difference in my water for the last couple of years. And I feel that Horsham Town and any of the other townships around, we've been getting nothing but the runaround. Each time I've called, they've told me there's nothing wrong with the water, everything is fine, everybody's in a panic for no reason. And I understand that we have to present these questions, but I want to know when and how this is going to be taken care of. Because so far, the water department has charged me to have new things put in, new meters put in. I don't want to have the cost to that, to be honest with you. I'm tired of paying the cost for something I didn't do. And I just want to know how quickly they, they plan, and why do they keep lying to us and telling us everything's fine, when it's not, because I've never heard such sad stories of, as I've heard here tonight. I didn't know people were dying of cancer in my township. I'd rather live in Philadelphia where the water was at least uncontaminated. I mean, I, I just don't understand why this has taken everybody so long to, to address this situation. And that's all I really have to say. I just want to know when and how this is going to be resolved for everyone. And that's all I have to say. Thank you so much. Thank you. My name is Gregory Nesbitt. I'm a 
five-year resident of Horsham Township, four generations of my family have lived here. I have four children that I've raised here. I am on Horsham Council. I'm currently president of Horsham Council. Um, I've been here since the beginning of this morning's session. I've heard um, over and over and over again the same themes. And the themes are, first of all, we have had a proud tradition of having the military in our community. We've all, Horsham residents, have gone to the air show, driven by the base, looked with pride to that facility. Then the facility left, partially, and we still have the Air National Guard, thank goodness. But we now are faced with a new legacy, a legacy we never anticipated and never expected, but a legacy that we are now faced with right here and right now, and it's palpable. So two years ago, in a township building, almost to this day, when you folks had dropped the HAL to 70 after kind of unexpectedly dropping it, when we thought all was good with the prior level, we no longer felt secure or safe. So we set our own level. We went to non-detect. We weren't going to wait, and we did it. But unfortunately for folks like you, we've had to have a surcharge in their water bill. So now they're being doubly sanctioned. They're being doubly sanctioned by having to have consumed this water, we've all consumed it, and Lord knows what the levels were in the past, because we know they must have been higher, and there's this term of bioaccumulation. I never knew what that term was, and now I've learned it, which means over the time, it accumulates in your blood. So I guess if there's a positive here right now, it is that Horsham Township, Warrington Township, Warminster Township has said, no, we're not going to wait. And thank God we didn't wait, because now the ATSDR is saying that the levels that are really much more reliable, I know it's just a draft, and I know it needs to be vetted, and I know the science needs to catch up. I got one minute. We don't need to wait for the science. The state or the federal government should drop the levels, and they should draw a circle around these communities, and what they should do is they should say, okay, they've bioaccumulated, they've had years of exposure, Let's not wait to figure out the science. Drop the levels. The Navy has said they will pay for whatever the appropriate state or federal level is. And then for we can return the surcharge to these folks that have had to pay for the remediation that they shouldn't have to pay for. We know who contaminated. We know how it's contaminated. And last but not least, we're finally doing some remediation for the water that's coming off the base. Thank you, Navy, that you're going to now treat the water that's coming off the base. But let's get more aggressive with all the storm water that's coming off the base so that that problem is not cycling back in and we're treating it again and again and again in this constant spiral. So it's waste or storm water needs to be treated. That's the last point I wanted to make, and thank you for your for, Thank for the you time. so much. Hello, thank you for having us here. My name is Robert Weiner. I'm retired Navy. I retired in 2006 out of Willow Grove. I did almost five years there. Um, that wasn't my, obviously wasn't my first duty station. Um, for eight to 10 hours a day, five to six days a week, I drank the water out of the water fountains there. I drank it. I stepped up at a water fountain. There was no sign on those water fountains that says, do not drink the water. But I can sure tell you that there was people on the base that knew, that knew something different. You talk about firefighting at Willow Grove and Warminster, the bases. The foam has been used for a long time, a real long time, maybe 50 years. They knew about this, the hazards of this foam. They did. Acquisition and procurement of this product is done through the military, DOD, through mill specs. Military, DOD, they come up with requirements that they need. They, they look for manufacturers that can provide that. They get together and they come and they, they put these products to use in the military, and one of them was AFFF, this foam. Who in the right mind makes decisions to use stuff that's this volatile, really? Why was the chemical decided to be used? Why was it so attractive to the military? Okay, it was attractive because it puts out fires well, 
aircraft fires well. Fires that involve metals that burn at very high heat that other firefighting foams will not put out, but this one will. They say that this, this product uh, saves lives. Saves lives. In the five years that I was at Willow Grove, I can't think of one life it saved. Not one. I can think of a lot of people that it affected, and a lot of them are out, right out here. It affected a lot of people. Since I left in 2006 from the military, I've developed two serious health issues, diabetes and Graves' disease, a thyroid condition. I have not been tested to find out if I have this stuff in my body. Why? The biomonitoring bio system that they've just started here in the last couple of months, it takes the people randomly near the base, the residents, Okay, and I hope every resident that's here is monitored. And if there's something wrong, I hope that, that the government steps up. I don't know that that'll happen. But I'm a veteran. I don't live in the area of this cont contamination. I live in New Britain. And they don't offer monitoring for us. They don't. Who, who's looking out for the veterans right now? Who? Thank you so much. When you have a second, would you please pass I'm the mic sorry. down? Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Seth Kellogg. I'm with, I represent the National Groundwater Association, and we were really pleased to be included in the national meeting, as well as being able to come and attend this meeting today. Um, I'm also a hydrogeologist with 25 years of experience, and I work for Geosyntech Consultants. So, um, I guess NGWA values are the opportunity to get the local perspective as well as the national perspective. Um, I'd like to thank Director Gravatt for calling out specifically today the challenges of private wells and funding for private well owners um, that came out of the meeting in D.C. We advocate for regulatory certainty and consistency around PFAS, and it's critical for both private well owners, water systems, and industry. Decisions need to be based on sound science, but there are policy and resource limitations that need to be clearly discussed and debated with communities. Also, funding for technical assistance to private well owners, specifically around licensing for treatment system operators and installers and well installers. Um, should that be something that professional engineers or professional geologists are, are involved with? Um, and also, risk communication is incredibly critical, and NGWA is happy to support EPA's efforts in any way that we can as far as risk communication comes around PFAS. Um, lastly, we advocate for best practices to prevent all contamination from getting into groundwater, so PFAS, but all contamination in particular, all contamination in general. And one thing that was brought up at the national meeting in Region 1 was that many of these PFAS compounds are still in use. Um, and so in, I know in Region 1 they're developing best practices around f aqueous foam forming foams, um, but that's something that needs to be considered everywhere. Thank you so much. Will the next four speakers please come up to the table? Will speakers 15 through 19 please come up um, to the stage and sit on the on-deck chairs? Whenever you're ready. Hi, my name's Nick Crisco. I've lived here since 87. Um, the fact that we're sitting here right now begging the EPA to do something is already too late for me. My son is nine years old, has meloplastoma, which is brain cancer. He was a perfectly healthy kid. I've heard 15 different other kids in the air area that is under the age of 10 that's had brain cancer. 
Um, you can hear this story from uh, everybody that came up here to tell this story, and it's already too late. Step up and do something, because we as citizens are being affected in this way. You've known about it, we know it now, we know about it now, and it's time for you guys to step up and do what's right. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Sarah Kaspar. From 1988 to 2004, I worked at Region 3 and various offices. And in 1999, it was a normal day in removal enforcement until a friend of mine came down and told me about a phone call she had received from a veterinarian in Parkersburg, West Virginia. When I finally got a hold of the, of the veterinarian, I found out the name and the phone number of her client, so I called him. His name was Wilbur Tennant. I think a lot of you are familiar with that name, and you ought to be. So I finally got out to Parkersburg and did a study where the dry run landfill owned by DuPont was located in the area, in the valley. It drained into the dry run stream, which was the valley which Mr. Tennant grazed his cattle. The tenants had owned the property that the landfill was on and had the rights to graze cattle there in perpetuity. And the pictures, the videos that he had given us of his cattle, you would have been appalled. The stories of the rashes, et cetera, that he and his daughter experienced from being around that area were pretty significant. And the fish kills that we saw were also significant. So we set up a small mammal study that went from where the, the mouth of the dry run, where it went into another stream, to the place where the dry run landfill emptied in or drained into the stream. And you can probably guess what the result was. By the time you got up to the dry run landfill, there were no small mammals at all, none, zero. As compared to the beginning of the study at the other end where it was normal and healthy. So we worked there, we took, we took, uh, well, they're probably still around somewhere, the organs of the small mammals that we collected to be studied. And we worked with Mr. Tennant, we got information, and finally, one of the people who worked for DuPont, who monitored what went into the wastes, or what do we call it, material, something or other now. And he said, the landfill, which was supposed to be non-hazardous materials from DuPont, contained C8. So initially, I had no clue what C8 was, but I learned pretty quickly. And I went back to EPA, and I said, this is what the problem is. RECRA had a few years ago cited DuPont for their um, on-site impoundments, which had C8 in them, among other things, for, con for polluting the uh, public water. And I thought, well, if that was an issue, why isn't this an issue too, where it's impacting a man and his livelihood? Well, C8 
is not a hazard listed hazardous substance. Now that was back in 1999, and here we are in 2018, and this is a common theme throughout this whole day. What took you so long? Mr. Tennant and his wife both died of cancer. Fortunately, not fortunately that they died, but it was fortunately after a settlement had been brought about thanks to Mr. Balot. But that doesn't bring your life back. So that brings me to Pennsylvania. Thank you so much. Will you please pass the mic down to the next speaker? Okay, I'm going to say this anyway. The fracking fluids, the fracking fluids contain PFOA. We have been trapped with the Halliburton loophole. If these become listed hazardous substances, then people who are suffering from the f impacts of health, impacts from the fracking can do something. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, my name is Stephanie Wine. I'm the clean water advocate at Penn Environment, a nonprofit uh, that works for clean air and clean water across the Commonwealth with thousands, over 100,000 members and activists uh, throughout the state, including um, hundreds uh, in Horsham, hundreds in Warminster, um, and in the affected area. Um, and so, what I, in my role as our clean water advocate and working with us for the last seven years, um, there's a really common theme in calls that come into our office from this part of the state, which is that people are concerned about PFAS in their drinking water and they want to know what they can do about it. And so I've been hearing that concern from citizens for years. And usually we're the group that has the tools. We're the group that sues polluters. We're the group that goes to elected officials, be it in Harrisburg or in Washington, and tells them that they have to be accountable about pollution to their constituents. And the difficulty here is that because these aren't listed as hazardous substances, we don't have the power to fill that role. We don't have the laws on our side to protect people's health, and that's not a position that I appreciate being in. It's not in a position that our members appreciate being in. And so what do we know? We know that this is a carcinogen. We know that it's an endocrine disruptor, which is harmful to hormonal function. We know that it impacts people's thyroid function, something that my family already has problems with, so I don't need extra risks. Um, and that we know that it impacts low birth weight and that when you have low birth weight, you have problems the rest of those infants' lives. And we also know that it's persistent that once it's in the environment or in people, that it sticks around. We know from the lessons of DDE and DDT that once you have those in the environment, you have to deal with them for a long time. So those are chemicals that we especially need to apply the precautionary principle to. And we also know that here in Pennsylvania, our constitution guarantees us a right to clean water. That's what we know. Why is this substance hazardous in Europe, but not in the United States? Why is this substance hazardous in Vermont, but not in Pennsylvania? So what do we need? We need PFAS and all its associated chemicals, including PFOA, to be listed as hazardous substances. And we also need the EPA to explain why recently it has been so reluctant to list new hazardous substances. The government must take full responsibility for the contamination that has happened here. We need an expedited remediation plan, and we need community testing. When we know there's a pervasive pollutant, we need to test. We know there's a pervasive lead pro problem in Pennsylvania, so the governor has extensive testing now for blood lead levels of lead in Pennsylvania. We know this is a per pervasive problem with this chemical, so we need testing for this too. And what we need to be able to defend to Pennsylvanians the, we, need our, we need Pennsylvanians to be defended by our laws and by the EPA. That is exactly what this agency was set up to do. And therefore, we need it to f fulfill its role, fulfill its job, and protect our health and environment. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Kathleen Joyce. I'm the District Office Director for State Representative Madeline Dean. Uh, Madeline could not be here with us tonight. She asked me to make the following remarks. 
Um, I want to thank the EPA for coordinating today's forum and public comment session. And while I appreciate the opportunity to share my concerns, the EPA should not need to hear from me or anyone else in order to act. We know there are harmful PFA contaminants in our region's drinking water, and we know it's within our collective power to eliminate these contaminants. I urge the EPA to shift their focus from listening to acting and do it quickly and aggressively. <laughs> Additionally, the, the lack of direction on the federal level is no reason for any of us to wait to, to know to make things safer, to correct things for our health. No level of PFAs are proven safe in our drinking water, and we have to be a leader in addressing this issue head on and make choices to push towards zero detection for PFAs. To accomplish this goal, we need better participation from all levels. It will take a united front to make the quickest changes to the lowest PFA levels. Now that includes not just, it's not just one jurisdiction. That's gonna be Aqua, North uh, Wales Water, Ambler Borough Water Authority, all of the water authorities, the EPA, the DEP, and the DOD. Um, you know, we don't have to wait any further to act. We know it's in our water. We know it's not safe. Act now to get it out. There's no reason to wait for more studies and more listening. Act now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Will the next speaker please come up to the table? And this is the last call. Anyone in the four to five or five to six hour that would like to speak, please come on up as well. If anyone is in the four to five or five to six hour and they have not spoken yet. Come on up. I'm not sure if I'm not budding in line. I'm the last of the six. Oh, okay. I'm 19. <laughs> okay. Whenever y'all are ready, you may begin. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. I'd like to thank EPA Region 3 for hosting this uh, opportunity to give uh, our input. And I'd also like to thank all of the hardworking public service professionals at our water utilities at DEP um, who are working on our behalf to protect our health. My name is Julie Kohler. I'm a 38-year resident of Horsham Township. For over a decade, uh, actually maybe 14 years, I invested in my professional life. I worked with the Water Resources Education Network, traveling the state of Pennsylvania as a contractor on behalf of the League of Women Voters to Pennsylvania DEP and EPA under the Safe Drinking Water Act on behalf of the Source Water Protection Program. Little did I know while I was out doing public education workshops in every county of Pennsylvania to encourage residents and local officials at the county level and so forth and business communities to come together in coalitions to protect our public drinking water that in my own backyard we were seeing such a horrific uh, change in what was happening in, in uh, Horsham Township. For that reason, I would like to offer some input based on my expertise in source water protection and working with many communities across the state for safe and clean drinking water. So I have the following recommendations. It is important, as many speakers have already said, to holistically address the PFAS compounds, similar in the way that you change the approach with the uh, clean air amendments to treat hazardous air pollutants um, collectively rather than piecemeal with the individual air pollution uh, contaminants. That might be a useful way to approach it. Next would be to act now. Every 24 hours of delay delays protection. Every 24 hours that goes by. 
A lot of the discussion today focused on remediation. I would encourage that this is dealing with the problem after the horse is out of the barn. We need a significant investment and commitment to renew to source water protection, as Mr. Grace spoke to this morning. Um, we need to put into place a robust multiple barrier approach with a key component of source water protection focused on prevention with adequate funding under the Safe Drinking Water Act. We have, I want to commend the work DEP has done to do rigorous delineations over the years of many of our groundwater sources. However, many of those nice reports are, do nothing but serve as, um, you know, doorstops. They're not being put into action, and that data is also here in Horsham. Um, we have delineated with $50,000 worth of taxpayer money, and yet we've done nothing with that, including not getting an approved source water protection plan. It's important to protect the remaining sources of groundwater that we do have available uh, because we are blending the water. Um, the last point I would like to make is that our healthcare community also needs to be engaged. Our po public service people, or excuse me, public health officials need to know that sh they should be asking residents questions when they come in with medical maladies of what is the source of their drinking water. Uh, DEP or EPA does have a program they developed years ago called Tap Into uh, Protecting Your Tap Water, I believe, that would encourage and provide training for healthcare professionals. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Hi, good evening. My name is Henry Betts. Uh, I'm coming to, uh, to this forum as a private citizen. I am not a scientist. However, <clears throat> I live in a house that was built in 1965 by my second wife and her first husband. She uh, made the house to be an in-law situation, and her mother also resided there. Um, all three of those people are now gone. They died from the same uh, pancreatic cancer. And I find that to be entirely uh, a question of something that should be looked into scientifically. I think that the EPA, I think that the CDC should be involved in this and get it on board. Now, I brought this question up about a year and a half ago at a meeting here in the same hall and was lucky enough to make contact with uh, a person in the state of Pennsylvania and they've made a study and sure enough they found that women uh, <coughs> in the water supply area in Warrington, Pennsylvania that, that supplied this house, that house, um, by God they, they have twice the rate of uh, of this disease than is expected in the state of Pennsylvania. So <clears throat> it's in the report from Pennsylvania. And I think that it needs to go national to look at this. Now, I know that other things nationally have been already, uh, <clears throat> from cancer standpoints, other, thing, other cancers have been included. But I'd like to see that added to the national agenda. So that's my say, and I know you can't bring back three people that I know, but they're gone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Whenever you're ready. Thank you. My name is Heshi Siegel, and I'm the founder of Kids Better World. I run a global clean water campaign called Purity for Humanity. I just returned from Africa, where I brought these filtration systems to children. They don't need the PFOAs and PFOSs, but this filter takes it out. One of my concerns is that we are giving people bottled water. We are destroying the environment with the bottles that we are using. The fish in the ocean love the plastic at this point, so we're also eating it. So if there are solutions, then we really need to take advantage of them. So I have a program where if any of you out here or if you know of anyone who has a child who is now suffering as a result of this, I can give them this bottle so that they don't have to drink 
bottled water. This morning I met someone who had been on one of the videos and I was able to give her two bottles for free for her children. So we need to address the idea that we are just polluting our environment with plastic bottles and it doesn't have to be that way. 5,000 children die every day from drinking contaminated water around the world. I tried to get a hold of Flint, Michigan. I called everyone and no one responded. On my way to Africa a month ago, and I just came back, I watched the movie Flint. This area doesn't have to be like Flint. We have to be able to do something, not just for the adults, but the children. I mean, if Gandhi or Oprah or Martin Luther King died before they were five, we would be at a loss. We really need to protect our children. And if there's anyone who has a child who is young and is now suffering as a result of this, please get in touch with me. My name is Heshi Siegel. I'm the founder of Kids Better World, and I run a global water campaign, Purity for Humanity. Thank you. Thank you so much. Did you say that filters, PFOS? Yes, everything. Good evening. My name is Donald Keir. I'm a 30-year resident of Warrington. I also work up in this area. Uh, the reason I requested to speak is we've been working at, at our company very closely with Warminster. Uh, we have a blue box that sits over by the well right outside the high school. And our frustration has been we produce water from the contaminated wells using the technology that we've developed over the last three years with another Philadelphia company that produces non-detectable levels of PFOS in the water. And yet we've struggled, you know, a similar story, we've struggled with getting acceptance, and we have 18 months worth of data. We've struggled with getting acceptance uh, on a government level, on an engineering level, uh, even though we keep presenting the data. And uh, you know, everything I've heard as I'm sitting here is if we only had a solution or the solutions aren't working, we're producing with wells in place right now in Warminster uh, and in Horsham non-detectable BFOS levels uh, without some of the problems that the traditional technologies have. It, it exists. I would just encourage you guys to, to look into a resin op, it's a resin option. And it, it provides a cost-effective solution at about 25% of the cost of what is currently used in Newburgh, here, uh, New Hampshire, a couple other places that we've been visiting trying to spread the word, if you will. But, uh, you know, for everybody out there, the, the, there is a technology out there on a large scale that can treat these wells. Thank you so much. Is there anyone else out there who has signed up to speak in the four to five or the five to six time slots that have not come up and spoken already? If not, we will take a short break and we will reconvene in the next 20 minutes, so around 5.45, and we will start the six to seven time slot. Thank you so much.